When I come Sunday morning, I just say a prayer that uh, Jesus will put the right words in my mouth. And I just want the children to know that Jesus loves them no matter what. My name is Janice Hash. I serve in base camp. I teach kindergarten and first grade. The kids call me Miss Janice. Kids in base camp keep me young. Um, they, they make me laugh. <laughs> and when I leave here on Sunday mornings, I usually have a smile on my face. So one day from the stage, they were asking for volunteers in, in the base camp for the summer. So I volunteered and I'm on my fifth year at base camp. I learn right along with them. When I teach the basic Bible stories that we learned long ago when we were kids, uh, I'm learning them all over again. They surprise, children surprise me because um, actually in large group, sometimes it looks like they're not paying any attention. But they are because when we come back into the small group, they know the, they know the answers. I am the bread. I am the light. They're really smart little kids, <laughs> smart little minds, and uh, they ask a lot, of, a lot of good questions. Volunteering is, uh, has always been important to me, um, especially in the church. How can a church run without volunteers? I do know in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Christ is the head and the partners or members are all of the parts of that body. So a church, all the members of the church have to be doing something to make the church run properly. Serving in base camp, this is my way of saying thank you. Thank you to Jesus. Um, he died for me so that I could have eternal life. I say thank you. I think thank you, Jesus. This is my way of doing it. Well, hello and welcome to Summit. Thanks for joining us in worship. I'm so glad that we have a chance to worship together today. And if you've ever wondered what it looks like to live out the vision here at Summit, Janice is the perfect picture. Being willing to give of ourselves so that others have the opportunity to hear about Jesus, that's who we are at Summit. And if you want to get involved with that, you can click the link below. We would love to get you connected with volunteering. It'd be an amazing way to serve. And if you're new or visiting, I'm especially glad you got to hear that story because you get a little bit of a peek of who we are as a church. And if you want to find out more about Summit, click the Get Connected link. We'll be in touch and tell you a little bit more. I want to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up in the life of the church that are really important. The first is this, um, Easter is coming. So on April 17th, we have Easter services, and though there will be an opportunity online, we would love to invite you to join us in person. And uh, we're gonna be having services at all of our locations. You can find out more at the link below, RSVP, so that you can reserve seats for yourself. And if you're inviting some friends, we know it's a really invitational time. We would love to have you as part of that. It would be a joy to be together with you. Uh, something else that's coming up is we have an online partnership class happening. And partnership is Summit's kind of version of membership, but really what does it look like to partner in ministry here at Summit? What does it look like to fully live out the vision? It's a chance to spend some time with leadership and learn a little bit more about Summit. Whether you're new or you've been around for a long time and wanna find out more, we would love to have you as part of that. It's happening on Tuesday, March 29th. Click the link below, sign up, we'll get you all the information. We'd love to be a part of that with you. Well, we're going to continue with our worship in a couple of ways this morning. We're going to continue by singing songs and hymns to God with our band. And we're also going to continue with our teaching. We're in a series called The Affections of Jesus, where we're taking a look at what moves God's heart through the person of Jesus and his earthly ministry. What were the things that stirred him? What were the things that stirred him emotionally so that we can see the heart of God on display? And I am so glad that you get a chance to hear from my friend Kaylee. She's going to be sharing the message with you today. So just lean in. You're going to be blessed by this today for sure. We're also going to continue with our worship by the giving of our tithes and our offerings. And if you're newer visiting, again, we're super glad you're here. Please don't feel any obligation to give. We would just love for this service to be a gift to you. But if you're a partner here at Summit, if you're a follower of Jesus, there's a good chance you know why we give. 
Uh, we give out of obedience to scripture. We give because God has entrusted his resources to us. And we have an opportunity to leverage those for his work here in our church, in our local community, and around the world. So now I'm gonna invite you to worship with us, to continue your worship of Jesus, who is the giver of new life. Now the green blade rises from the buried grain. We that in the darker many days has lain. Love lives again that with the dead has been. Love is come again like wheat that's ringing free. 
not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the boast Of sin and grave The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised To life again You have no rival You have no equal Now and forever God you reign Yours is the kingdom Yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names What a powerful name it is What a powerful name Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to open up your word and to look at some of your most human characteristics, some of the things that we can often overlook in your word that make you so much more like us than we could imagine or hope for, um, the things that make you relatable, the things that help us to know that you really have experienced all of our pain, that you really do know what it's like to live in this broken world, and that you know that we're the ones who caused that brokenness and yet you love us anyway and pursued us to the point of death. Lord, we are so grateful. We pray that as we look at this passage in Mark 5 today, that you would impress upon us the incredibly relentless love that you have for us and that it would open up, it would open us up to trust you more and more. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen. Well, if you are joining us, we are in the midst of our Lenten series, The Affections of Jesus, where we are looking at these human emotions that Jesus experienced, where he gets angry, he weeps, he rejoices. All of these moments that humanize him, we we remember that he's fully God, but he was also fully human and we can forget that. So as we reflect upon these passages, our hope is that we will be disabused of our silly notions about what he's like, that he's this big kind of dictator in the sky. He's not. He's, he's not. he's not proud. He's tender, right? He wants the little children to come and interrupt him when he's teaching his disciples and, and important Christian-y lessons about important christian things, right? He's not exclusive, he's inclusive. He touches a leper, the most unclean of the unclean. He didn't have to touch him in order to heal him, but he did it anyway. He's he's not legalistic, he's generous. Chad talked about how he healed this man with a withered hand on the Sabbath because he's more interested in healing the brokenness in our world than he is in impressing religious people. This is the character of our God. I mean, what a guy, right? Honestly, the the easiest way to start loving Jesus more is to read stories like this that show just how lovable he is. And this is it, this whole series, man. This is the goods, people. Soak it up. It's lovely. So our passage today is from Mark chapter five, and it's a bit of a twofer. We're gonna witness Jesus' healing of this woman who has been afflicted with a constant issue of blood. She's been bleeding for 12 years. And her story shows up smack in the middle of a story where this man has a little girl, who's also 12, um, who's at the point of death, and he petitions Jesus to come and heal her. And you get the impression uh, throughout the book of Mark, if you've read it, uh, that Jesus is a really busy guy. Before these stories, he's been teaching 
kind of constantly. Um, he's calmed. He's he's silenced a storm, a hurricane that's about to sink the disciples' boat. After that, he casts out a legion of demons, not one, whole bunch of demons. He casts them out into uh, into some pigs so that this man who's been afflicted can be free of them. So he's been doing some stuff. You know, Gary touched on this. One of the things that I think m- makes Jesus most lovable is the fact that he is so incredibly interruptible. He's been doing really important things. And he allows himself to be interrupted by this man who is desperate for his little girl to be saved. And and, and Jesus is on his way to do important things, right? After this story, he's going to go and he's going to commission his his disciples to go and do miracles in his name. And, and, And he's on his way to do that when he's approached by this man with his little girl. And in first century Judea, her life would mean nothing. She's a 12 year old girl. You know, a couple, couple years later, she'd get married, probably have some kids, might not even learn to read. So he's on his way to give 12 men, disciples, power to do miracles in his name. And he's stopping to help this man and his little girl who wouldn't have mattered much to a lot of the people at that time. And not only is he interruptible to do that, but in the middle of rushing off to help this man with his little girl, he's interrupted again by this woman who has this issue of blood, and he allows himself to be interrupted again to help her. So let's look together at Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders, named Jairus, came and he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying, please come and put your hand on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there, who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she had been freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. They were a little sassy. You see the people pressing against you and you're asking who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, that's an important phrase, while Jesus was still speaking, Some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went into where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. I love the end of that story, by the way. Jesus is so practical. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, you just raised a little girl from the dead. And he's like, can someone get her a sandwich? It's a hard work being dead all morning. Can someone get her a sandwich? <laughs> and, and I just, I love that because it shows how practical Jesus' love of us is and how he wants to meet even our practical needs. So we see this emotional side of Jesus, right? He's moved with compassion for this man and his little girl. Uh, But we also see his determination. He pursues this woman, this bleeding woman who's been healed until she has to talk to him. She has to start a relationship with him, even though he has more pressing matters to get to. So there's so much to mind here about the character of Jesus, not just about his human emotions, but about that relentlessly loving, pursuing nature of his grace. And so we're going to look at those things and hopefully by extension, we will become more open to trusting him. I mean, what a breath of fresh air it would be for our walk of faith if, if, if not only we, we trusted God to be interruptible with the little things that are our problems that we're afraid to take to him because this isn't really a big deal, but not only that, but the, the, the enormous problems 
that we're afraid to trust him with the outcomes with. That would be such a gift to us if we really trusted him with the outcomes of our lives and it would open us up to receiving more and more of his love and, and, and then imitating it so that we could help people find him and know that there is a God who loves them this much and more. Okay, so, so three things about this kind of relentlessly loving grace of Jesus Christ that I want us to, to just tease out from these passages. First, Jesus's grace reverses the world's priorities. This is really important. I, I, and I find this both endearing and also chastising. And I think it makes Jesus very lovable. So what's going on right now? We have this synagogue leader, right? And he has just come to Jesus saying, please help, my daughter is dying. So just from that little bit, we can already, we can already know a few things. One, we know this guy is male. One, we know he's rich. One, we know he's educated. And wait, one... Two, we know he's rich. Three, we know he's educated. And four, we know that he is religious. He's also very courageous and faithful. And I do want to point this out. And we know that because he's not afraid to be seen with Jesus, asking him for help in the daylight, in the middle of a crowd. And that would have been frowned upon by the other synagogue leaders. It would have been frowned upon by the Pharisees. And we know, we, we saw another synagogue leader, right? Nicodemus, who came to Jesus. But he did so in the cover of night in secret because he was afraid to be seen with Jesus. And Jairus isn't. He has a strong, steadfast faith. So, so that's the situation, right? This, this faithful, rich male synagogue leader has asked Jesus to help him because his little girl is in urgent need. And in first century Judea, men were here, women were here. The rich were here, the poor were here. The, the unclean were here and the clean were here. The, the religious were here, right? And then the non-religious were here. And yet, in the middle of rushing off to save this rich male religious leader's daughter, Jesus stops. He stops treating what is an urgent need to then deal with a chronic one for this woman who has been bleeding 12 years, which feels a bit backwards. In the medical profession, this would be considered mal malpractice, right? You, you, you have stopped treating an urgent need to treat a chronic one. Yes, she's bleeding, but she's been bleeding for 12 years. I mean, she's, she's okay, right? We gotta get a move on Jesus. This little girl is about to die. And I cannot imagine how Jairus must have felt when Jesus stops to have a conversation with this woman. I can't imagine because I've never had a child at the point of death. I can't imagine, but, but I would guess that he is in absolute agony. Just every second that Jesus is still saying words or listening to words, Jairus is probably in absolute agony because all of those seconds matter to him. They matter because his little girl might not make it. What are you doing? What are you waiting for? How can you take this long and call it loving? We're going to talk about that in just a minute. So I don't want you to forget that point, but we're going to come back to it. Uh, we need to finish this point first. So what I want, before we get there, what I want to make sure we don't miss is the fact that we can learn from Jesus allowing himself to be interrupted during this urgent matter. We learned that Jesus, to Jesus, the unclean, poor, irreligious woman is just as important to the creator of the world as this rich, male, religious man with incredible faith. And we need to let that sink in. We need to know that this is the character of our God and that nobody is less or more important to him no matter what they've done or failed to do. There's a man who sits uh, at the intersection of the Starbucks on Colonial and he's there every morning and he is holding up a sign asking for money and sometimes he's really kind and sometimes he shouts at people. And that man matters as much to Jesus Christ. He is as valuable in the eyes of God as I am as you are, as my daughter is, as your golden child is, who do you think is less deserving of God's love? Who do we think, who do I think is less deserving of God's love? I mean, the people who are trying to scam you, the people who subscribe to that certain political ideology, those terrible Christians who are really mean to waiters, I mean, who is it that you think that you're better than and that, that therefore they are less deserving of the love of God. Listen, we do not get to decide the value of another human being before our God, but we can know, we can know that we are not special. We're not special just because we happen to be good Christian-y type of people. 
And that's chastising to me. Do you know why? Because I am a religious person. I am a religious person and it's chastising to me because I have to fight my expectation for Jesus to do what I believe he owes me because I am such a good Christian for him. So I imagine Jairus was dying inside every minute that passed while Jesus stopped to chat. And so I, I deeply identify with him. I deeply identify with Jairus. But, but I also, I love, I love that Jesus almost always connects first with the people who need him most. The marginalized, the sinners. He is a God of grace and he reverses the world's priorities. He's a God of grace. His power, he tells us, is made perfect in weakness. And so it doesn't matter how powerful or beautiful or wealthy or how much you've achieved. It's the one who admits he is in great need that Jesus gets to first. To Jesus, to get Jesus, to get Jesus, you don't need money, you don't need power, you don't need status, you don't even need religion. To get Jesus, all you need is nothing. All you need is nothing. Is need, And that's why the poor and the sinners tend to get him first. They know much better than a synagogue ruler. They know much better than religious people like you and me that without his grace, they have nothing. And so it's chastising to me because I often slip into that, that poisonous thinking that God owes me something because of my faith in him. That poisonous thinking that God owes me something and therefore his delay in helping me is a failure on his part or a lack of love. Which brings us to our next point, Jesus's grace. So first, uh, Jesus's grace reverses the world's priorities. Second, Jesus's grace almost never works on our timeline. Faith in Jesus is not the same thing as faith in your agenda for Jesus. Let me say that again. Faith in Jesus is not the same thing as faith in your agenda for Jesus. Three years ago, last week, I, uh, I lost a baby. Um, and having Ember, our seven-year-old daughter, was super duper easy. We got married, Rob sneezed on me, and I was holding the baby. I mean, it was so, so fast. And so it was a real surprise for us when, you know, two years after that, we tried again, and we couldn't get pregnant. And we tried, five years we tried and, and nothing, and we prayed, and we petitioned God, and I had Ember, our daughter, put her hand on my belly and pray that God would put her baby in it, um, and, and, and nothing. And then one day, I end up going to the ER for what I thought was a kidney stone, and I get there, and uh, the nurse comes back, and he says, hey, do you know that you're pregnant? And I was like, no, but that's incredible, and I'm so excited, and I call my mom, and the nurse gives me a fist bump, and everything is awesome. Um, and, and, and then about an hour later, a doctor comes in and tells us, we're so sorry, but the pregnancy is ectopic, which means that the, the embryo has gotten stuck in my fallopian tube. It, it, it attached inside the tube, and so the baby's not going to make it. And unless they put me in surgery in like a few hours and remove that fallopian tube, I'm not going to make it because it's going to rupture and I'm going to bleed out. And so the very next morning, I was sitting in a hospital gown with a needle in my arm, weeping and praying to God, I know you can change this. We have been begging you for this child. And I know you can change this. I know you can do a miracle. But if you don't hurry up, if you don't hurry up and give us that miracle, then my baby's not going to make it. I mean, God didn't do a miracle. And I don't, have any, I don't have another baby. And I have one tube left. Have you ever thrown in the towel on your faith because Jesus didn't work on your timeline? I hope you don't. I wish to God 
that he would have given me that miracle. I wish that he would have behaved differently. This isn't a happy story that I can put a bow on. It is still deeply painful to me, but it has taught me something incredibly valuable in my walk with God, which is that asking why, why? It's not always helpful. It's relatable. It's absolutely what I wanna be asking, but it doesn't actually heal me. And you know, sometimes you have those unfortunate conversations with sweet, well-meaning people and someone has lost a child and they'll say something like, uh, well, you know, everything happens for a reason. And, and I hate when people say that because sometimes that reason is sin. Sometimes tragedy happens because of sin and brokenness in this world, and no one ever is ever gonna say to someone who just lost a baby, oh, well, you know what? Everything happens because of brokenness and sin. No, they would, get, they would get punched in the face. So one valuable bit of wisdom that I think we can learn from this story is that sin and brokenness in this world gets its clutches into all of us. It doesn't matter if you are powerful or rich or religious. It touches every single one of us. We cannot insulate ourselves from it. And so if we only ever ask the question, why is this happening? Why God didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Then not only are we probably not gonna get an answer, but we will misinterpret God's silence as indifference. And we'll spend a great deal of our lives wondering why he doesn't love us and it will be largely our own fault. That belief will be largely our own fault we don't need to know why. We know why. Because when sin entered the world, death and suffering came with it. And that sin and brokenness will be a part of this bent creation until Jesus comes back to set all things to rights. So a better question than why is what now? We will experience pain and loss in this world with or without Jesus. We will experience pain and loss in this world with or without Jesus. But with him, there's always a what now. And that what now will never lead us into despair. It will lead us into grief. It will lead us into acceptance. And ultimately it will lead us into hope. Because with Jesus, dead things tend to not stay dead. With Jesus, death is always a temporary separation. Jesus will always treat the greatest need first, and we just don't know what that is because we're not God. We don't have all the information that he does. We want him to hurry up and help us. Like Jairus, I, I, I know he wanted that, help my daughter. But D Jairus doesn't know everything that Jesus knows. Jesus knows that for him, curing a death is as easy as, as curing a fever. Jesus doesn't need help with that. And Jairus doesn't know, so he feels urgency and he wants Jesus to hurry. But punctuality is relative. I mean, if you live in the world, you know that. You know, there's places where being late means one thing and places where being late means something entirely. In Germany, if you're not 15 minutes early for a meeting, you're late and you should be expected to apologize. In Spain, Latin America, if you could be 20, 30 minutes late before you're expected to apologize. On the Isle of Yap in Micronesia, you could be four hours late to your own child's wedding before you are expected to apologize. Punctuality is, is, it's all relative. We don't all mean the same thing when we say you're taking too long. There's a verse, 2 Peter verse eight, Second Peter three verse eight. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. And religious people, we love that verse. We love to quote that verse. We're like, oh, it's a thousand, a thousand years is like a day, a day is like a thousand years. There's another part. There's verse nine, okay? So that's, that's verse eight. Verse nine says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. He's not slow as we understand slowness because it's relative. We call it slow. He calls it patient. 
because he doesn't want us to perish. And what we call slow, he calls taking the time to treat the whole patient and not just the symptom that we happen to be suffering from right now. Trust him. He knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing and he knows how fast he needs to do it because he's treating the whole patient. And more often than not, our greatest affliction is not what we think it is. It's not the job. It's not the health. It's not the child. It's not for the bleeding to finally stop. Often our greatest affliction is this poisonous thought that we know better than God what should happen and when it should happen. It was that poisonous thought, I know better than God, that led Adam and Eve to take that first bite that brought sin into the world and started this whole mess for all of us. It's that poisonous thought that I know better than God that makes it almost impossible for us to have a rich and healing trust relationship with him because delays of grace, that's what suffering is, right? It's a delay of grace. Delays of grace will do one of two things to the human heart. Either it will deepen your faith if you trust him, if you, if you believe that he really does know what he's doing and why, it will deepen your faith. It will make you patient. It'll make you wise. It'll make you better. It'll make you great. But if that delay of, 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 of grace happens and your heart is infected with this poisonous thought that you know better than God, what should happen and when I know best, then that delay won't make you better. It'll make you bitter. If I impose my arrogant ideas about what is best and when it's best onto Jesus, then I will never feel loved by him and it will be largely my fault. There is a difference between I can't see a good reason for this and there is no good reason for this. Those are completely different things. Just because we can't see a good reason for something, it does not mean that there isn't one. I can't imagine Jairus' heartbreak or anger even. You know, the, the worst has happened. The worst has happened and, 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 it, and you let it happen because you took too long, but he doesn't have all the information. Jesus does. And he says, no, it's not too late. Trust me. Let's go see your little girl. Jesus has all the information and Jesus knows his grace is powerful enough that it does not have to submit to time the way that we do. He stopped a hurricane by just saying, shut up. He cast out a legion of demons with one word. He said, out. Death bends its knee at a word from Jesus Christ. I promise you, Jesus knows better than we do what he needs to be doing and when he needs to be doing it. Jesus knows better than we do what can wait and what can't. Something, there's something about this bleeding woman that was more pressing to Jesus. And I can't tell you why, because I don't have all the information God does. All I can do is make an educated guess. And if I had to guess, this is what I would. Jesus knows, I would guess that this is more pressing because Jesus knows that he can force a dead body to come back to life but he can't force anybody to have faith in him. He can't force anybody into a relationship with him. Here's a woman with a quasi-magical, superstitious understanding of Jesus. If I just touch his robe, I'm gonna be magically healed. She has no idea about the kind of personal relationship that she needs to have with him in order to be healed, body and mind and soul. She has a flawed and weak faith. And so Jesus stops to heal her and to have what seems like this unreasonably long conversation about it to teach this woman and the crowd around her what it means to have faith in him, not just his miracles, but in him, to have a loving relationship with him that will lead to them being completely healed, body, heart, and soul. The little dead girl can wait. This lady only believes in Jesus' magic robes, but there is a chance that she can be made into a mature disciple with a clear understanding of what it means to have faith in Jesus Christ and that she will spend her life as a result of this one interaction making more and more disciples 
who will be in loving relationship with Jesus, and that has to be capitalized on now. The little dead girl can wait because Jesus Christ makes short work of a resurrection. Three days max, you know? Talitha kum. Those are the words he says to resurrect this little girl. Our, our translation is kind of clunky. Little girl, I say to thee, get up, or something like that. But Talitha, it's, it's, a, it's a diminutive. It's, it's, a, it's a pet name. Like, honey, sweetie. He's saying to this little girl, little girl, baby girl, upsy-daisy, upsy-daisy, honey. Death bends its knee to the words, even the pet names of Jesus Christ. So our last point, but our, our first two points, right? Jesus' grace reverses the world's priorities. Jesus' grace almost never works on our timeline. And finally, Jesus' grace comes at a cost. Now, it is absolutely more powerful than anything, even time, even death. I don't care who you are or what you've done. Put your faith in him. It's enough. He'll take care of you. He loves you. But it comes at a cost. Do you know why Jesus makes such a scene about this woman who touched him? I found this to be so interesting as I learned about it. There are all these people pushing on Jesus, all looking for a miracle, but he feels power go out of himself when this woman touches him, and he notices it. He is weakened. Power goes out of him. He's weakened by the touch of this woman. Why? He is teaching us something important about his grace. He's giving us an object lesson. He's teaching us that in order for this woman to become strong, he has to become weak. In order for us to be saved, he had to be forsaken. In order for us to be made clean, he had to become unclean. His grace is more powerful than anything, yes, but it comes at a cost only not to you, not to me, to him comes at a cost to him. One of the most lovable things about Jesus Christ is that he loves you to death. He loves you to death. So whatever you think following him is costing you, I promise you, it cost him more. Whatever you think he's getting from you and your faith, I promise you are getting more. The cost to him was death. The cost to us, it's, it's just, enough, just enough courage to reach out and grab his robe. And here's the great thing about faith. It's not about the amount you have. It's about the object. You don't need certainty. You just need a little courage. We have Jairus. He had a strong faith, a certain faith. This woman, she had a weak faith, a superstitious faith. But it's not the amount of faith that matters it's the object. Let me give you an example. Let's say there's three people and they're on top of a burning building and, and the, the firefighters have arrived and they are spreading out that like tarp trampoline thing at the bottom that's held up by half a dozen people and they want these people on top of the building to jump. Now let's say the first person is a lot like me and they're like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is how I die. I'm gonna jump off this building and I'm gonna die, but it'll be faster than getting burned to death, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump. And I jump, even though I don't think it's gonna work, and I'm saved. Second person, they're like 50-50 on it. You know, they're like, eh, maybe this'll work, maybe it won't work, but you know, definitely not into the flame thing, so I'm, I'll give it a try. They jump and they're saved, right? Then the third person, who's a previous, he's, he used to be a firefighter, and he's like, this is absolutely gonna work. I've done this thing like a dozen times. He jumps off and he's saved. Now, let me ask you this. Which one of those three people was most saved? Was it the third one? No, they are all equally saved because it's not about the quantity of their faith. It's about the object. They didn't have to, they didn't have to have perfect certainty. They didn't have to have some incredible amount of faith in that tarp at the, at the bottom of this building. All they needed was enough faith to jump, just enough to jump, just enough to step off the ledge. Jesus does not need you to be perfectly confident on day one. He doesn't need you to be perfectly certain. He just needs you to have enough courage to take that first step. Just enough to, to reach out and grab that robe. That's all you need. Can you do that? Can you muster that much? I promise you, if you do, if you do, you will experience more and more about what makes Jesus so lovable. 
I hope you will. What's the risk to you? Are you afraid that the worst might happen? The worst is going to happen. With or without Jesus, the worst is going to happen. We are all going to die someday with or without Jesus. But with him, you have someone who can take you by the hand and say, Talitha kum, time to get up, baby girl. Jesus lost his father's hand so that we could take it. He went to the tomb so that we could get out of it. He became unclean so we could be perfectly clean. Such is the power and grace of Jesus Christ that if he has us by the hand, we can know that death itself is nothing more than a good night's sleep. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your ongoing, never-ending, relentless pursuit of us. Thank you for the grace that is dripping in every interaction that we have, even when we don't see it. Lord, I pray for every person who might be hearing this message, who has experienced the kind of heartbreak that makes them question whether or not you are good. Would you heal them? Would you help them take that step of reaching out to touch your robe? Would you remind them of your loving kindness? Would you help us remember and keep in mind that we don't have all the information, and if we did, we would always ask you for exactly what you give us. Lord, would you heal your people today? It's been a long couple of years. (laughs) There's a lot of pain and loss in the world right now, Lord. We need to remember that you're good, even when you don't operate on our timeline, even when we think that you owe us and you don't give give us what we deserve. Lord, help us remember that it's your grace that makes sure we don't get what we deserve. Thank you, God. We pray all of this in the name of your patient and kind and loving son, Jesus Christ, in whom we put our hope. Amen.
dead Trembling over death by death Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead Trembling over death by death Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come away, come away Come and rise up from the grave No matter what it is that you've lost, no matter what it is that you're suffering with Jesus, when he has you by the hand, even death itself will bend its knee to his power and grace. I hope that you've enjoyed this service. If it's something that you found to be helpful and you want to share it with anyone else, I encourage you to share the link from below. Um, and for all of us, please hear these words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in God's loving kindness. The service is ended. <laughs>